prayer. All right, last time uh, we were looking at some flood evidence. And uh, again, kind of want to continue that line of thinking uh, today and try to show you a little pictorial uh, evidence as well as um, uh, talk about the Grand Canyon a little bit and uh, Mount St. Helens. Uh, some interesting things I've seen about that recently that I'll share with you. And uh, again, I ask you to jump in. If you've got any comments on anything we talk about, please do. We were discussing last time the idea that uh, there seems to be evidence that there was uh, more land showing at one time. And uh, certainly if uh, a lot of the water that we see today, some of the water that we see today was below the surface, then you have more land showing. And also post-flood, if you had the water locked up in ice uh, in some of the northern climates and far southern climates, uh, as it melted, it, was, it would raise the ocean levels is the thinking behind this. And many people believe that some of these lighter areas you see near the coastlines are areas that at least for a few years uh, before the, uh, after the flood, uh, might have been uh, land uh, that was shown at this point. Uh, even places like Australia might have been joined uh, to mainland Asia and this sort of thing by land bridges at one point in time. Uh, Mitch, I think this is the bell calls we're looking at this. Interesting to think that the North Sea might not have been there at all uh, post-flood. Of course, today, England is, and that's been a protector for England over the years. As the English Channel has helped them in some of the wars they fought with France and Germany and others, but uh, might have been connected at one time to all of this uh, area here. This is one picture, it's a great picture here, but here's an underwater tree in the North Sea, and I'm told that there are forests of trees under the water that divers have seen and radar has seen. Uh, in the U.S., same thing in the U.S., kind of a close-up here. A lot of the lighter area is what they call continental shelf, and areas that if the water level was raised, a lot of this up uh, in here is, a lot of the water in the Gulf of Mexico is anywhere from 60 to 600 feet deep, which by ocean standards is not very deep in the broad scheme of things. Maybe not all of this was showing, but again, this is a lot more shallow area here, which the Gulf of Mexico might have been more like a lake at one point in time, and connected to the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba and some of these areas here. Interesting to think about. And I had, um, I looked this up, I had a, um, a former teacher, I think it was a former teacher, went to a, a teacher reunion a couple of years ago, and somehow we got on this topic, and one of them was saying that uh, he had had diver friends and all that, and they'd gone off the coast of Alabama, and they had this type of thing there too. Uh, underwater trees, and again, that's not a great picture of it there, but underwater trees and stumps and this sort of thing. I read across an article from 1931 for the research I did on my uh, book related to Foley, but when they dug the canal, they started digging the canal in 1931, and uh, they finished it in 34. I think it's the first traffic that went through in 34. But it says they were digging uh, up through the dirt. They found like buried trees and all that underneath that, uh, that mud, which is interesting. is what we would expect if there was a flood. And I think they uncover flood evidence related to that. But I thought that was uh, an interesting thing, too. This is, uh, and again, you can see some of these pictures here. To me, as I look at that, you see flood evidence. And one thing that you'll see as you look at the, a lot of things out west, you'll see these layers. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But a creationist think, and I think, those are layers laid down by the flood. Their idea is millions and millions of years. Uh, a little sediment all the time, millions and millions of years. And the Grand Canyon is the poster boy of evolution. One of the poster boys. They love to point to the Grand Canyon for millions and millions of years. But when you study the Grand Canyon, it fits a lot more closely with what we believe in being laid down quickly and not over millions and millions of years. This little Colorado River that's the second part of that thing really doesn't add up. And when you look at that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so you see formations like this where you, you would have had during the flood, you would have layers of mud laid down very quickly, and then later on, as you have, um, you'd have uh, pools of water in various places that might break through and, and run and carve things out. That's what you'd see. And we've seen that in modern days at Mount St. Helens. Then we'll look at more later on. But you, you look at something like this. 
We were driving out west. Uh, we went out. Uh, I broke, went with Jane and her family uh, back in 2004 and uh, saw a lot of that area and went camping out there and, and had a good time, real good time. But as I looked out there, uh, over and over, to, to me, it looked like water evidence. There was a bunch of water at one time. There's not much now. It had to be water that formed some of these formations that we see. You got areas uh, called the Scablands. And I think this is the state of Washington uh, here, but you see, you get a lot of things like that. You got a little river or whatever flowing through an area right there that's a lot smaller than the canyon that it's in. And you see that in many, many places. But as you look, you see layers uh, when you look at the uh, soil, the sides. I guess so. I guess that's where the name came from. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that that, that would make sense. sense. Like, like a scab, scab on your skin, skin I guess. Good, Good point. point. Uh, Grant Cooley, I think this in Washington. Did you, you can see this kind of this canyon thing, thing that just formed here, here and not, not a lot of water flowing through that now. Uh, uh, satellite, satellite images of the scab lands that, again, yeah, a lot of this is dry now, but you can see what it looks like at one time, a lot of water that was held in some of these uh, places and lakes. They, they talk, talk about the Missoula flood. Uh, 3,000 square miles of what is now western Montana was over 2,000 feet deep at the edge of the glacial dam. It's not today, but it was at one time. And so we see that evidence, here's the scab lands where those are. You got the little, I say little, you got the Columbia River, but you got the canyons that are much, much bigger than the Columbia River in some of these areas. The Grand Ripples, it says Rolling Hills west of Spokane, Washington, are actually giant ripples up to 30 feet high and 250 feet apart. Again, a lot bigger than this river. But again, that was washed out, I think, post-flood. The Columbia River Gorge, same thing, very wide gorge, you see, but this uh, river uh, flowing through it. Erratics, what are erratics are? I looked this definition up again this morning to remind myself. But it said it's um, like out-of-place rocks. Sometimes, Sometimes we use the word erratic for performance that is kind of up and down or whatever. But the rocks are out of place. You get deposited either by flood water or ice or whatever. Here's a rock that is way out of place from anything around it. That's what it is. And again, I've never been there, but says, uh, there's an erratic rocks uh, state natural site in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which, which I guess is a bunch of rocks that have no place being there, but they're there. It's hard to explain. Uh, this, this is around Portland, Oregon. Oregon. Present day Portland measured against the water level of a temporary lake formed by the Missoula floods. So there's an artist's rendition of what this might have looked like at one time. This is now the sprawling city of Portland that, that there's, there's evidence that it was underwater at one time. Flood water is over 400 feet deep and traveling at over 90 miles per hour. Is this an estimate? Can you imagine the type of destruction that type of water would do? That, that much water, water traveling, traveling that fast, fast somebody says, how can it carve out some of these things, things we see? Very, very easily, very quickly, I could have done it. And, and equal to 10, 10 times the discharge of all the Earth's rivers today. today. And that's, that's what we, we, we see the evidence of that uh, all, all around is the point. point. Uh, dry falls, uh, again, again, channel areas, areas and scab lands that you see here, an artist rendition of what it might have looked like at one time as the waters broke through and flooded these areas. The, the Grand Canyon. Canyon. I've, been I've been there a couple of times, and the Lord, you've been to the Grand Canyon, Canyon? three times. Three times. Uh, it, 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 is is fascinating. Fascinating. it is fascinating. It is fascinating. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we got to go in 2004 and spend some time, time there, and we listen, listen to, I uh, never we'll forget our, our, um, our, our guide's name, Marvelous Marv. Marv. And so, so he gave us a tour and explained how this thing formed. How this little Colorado River caused this thing over millions of years. Fascinating. That little, that little Colorado, Colorado River did not carve that, that that you see in the Grand, in the Grand Canyon, Canyon, but that's their narrative. But you, but you, you see in the Grand Canyon, people talk about this, and we got a discussion later on on the geologic, geologic column. column. People talk about the Grand Canyon as representing the geologic column. It's, it's the most open uh, thing of this nature in the world, but it only has half of what they say the geologic column is supposed to be. Which, which, is, which, which is which is ironic, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later on. on. But, but you, you look, you see these layers. layers. 
And so, and so again, again, the, uh, the, the evolutionary, evolutionary idea is that these, 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 these layers, layers were laid very, very gradually over time, over, over millions, millions and millions of years. And then, and then the Colorado, Colorado River came and gradually over millions and millions of years washed away. But, but the thing, thing and, 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 and again, that's what they'll try to say. But it, but it points, points to me a lot. And, and, and I'm going to show you a quote from people, people that are not friends of, of, of uh, creation, creation who, who more, more and more, they're starting to come around the idea that maybe this, this thing happened, happened quicker than what we think that it did. So, and they, they haven't, haven't come, come all the way to our point of view yet, yet but they're coming there because they understand too, they're starting to understand, we can't explain this. But between the layers, all these layers are very evenly laid when you look at that. That's, That's not, not what you would expect over millions of years. Of years. We, we had, had um, this, this past year on our school campus, campus for, for, it seemed like for six, six to eight, eight weeks, and some, some of the guys in the room that walked back to our, to our locker room, room. No, no, my, my feet, feet were not uh, dry, dry for about two months, months. Uh, this, this past, 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 past August and September. September. I mean, it was just soaking wet. But what you see when you see areas where there's not any grass, it rains a lot. It doesn't, it doesn't say level, level. It, has it has channels and all that wash through, through it. it. That's, what That's what you see over a period of time. time. That's, That's not what you see here. That's, That's what you would expect to see. see. You'd expect to see it very uneven and that sort of thing. thing. That's, That's not what you see. see. All these are very evenly laid when you look at this, indicating it happened very, very quickly. Not at all. You don't see signs of erosion in between the layers and this sort of thing. You don't see it being uneven. It's very evenly laid. I think, I think it happened very, very quickly. quickly. So there's, there's the, the there's, there's the source of this great canyon, canyon that you're, that you're looking, looking at. at. This, this is a little Colorado. Colorado. Again, Colorado the Colorado River is the result of whatever, whatever, whatever it was that washed this thing out uh, uh, post flood. This, this is, is from the National, National Geographic. Geographic. Again, again, not a friend, friend of creation, creation as y'all know. know. But here's a quote from them. For a long time, scientists believed that the Grand Canyon was carved slowly over millions of years. Scientists also thought that the canyon had finished forming around 1.2 million years ago. But newer research has turned both theories upside down. Geologists now think the Grand Canyon grew in quick, violent spurts from the massive flooding of the Colorado River. And we believe it was massive flooding too. There may have been two very large lakes east of the Grand Canyon called Hoppy Lake and Grand Lake. There's, there's, it's, it's not, not there, there now. now. There's, there's evidence that, that it was at one time. time. Scientists, Scientists are also second-guessing the Grand Canyon's age. They, they think parts of the canyon are only about 750,000 years old, but maybe geologically speaking, and in some places it may still be growing. Again, they, again, they haven't come, come all the way to where they need to come, but they're coming that way. They're edging that way. So showing that even they are saying the things we thought about it don't really add up. So, so, again, again they've they still, still got ways to come to get to, get to where the, the, the Bible is, but they're, but they're coming there. there. So, so even, even, again, that's, that's not a friend of Christianity, Christianity saying, I have a quicker than what we think. That's exactly right. Yeah. 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 You're right. So here is a... Again, Again, a rendition, rendition. I, found I found this online, online. Uh, a couple, couple things, things about this, this. the river flows uh, this, this way, and, and again, another puzzle, this is called some problems, it gets, gets higher uh, this way as far as the, the eclipse, eclipse and that sort of thing. thing. You know, how, 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 how do you explain, explain that? that? Uh, so the uh, river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet elevation, and the rim is over 8,000 feet high, it's a lot higher on the north side than the south side. Yes. 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 Again, so again, hard to hard, hard to explain. So some of the river uh, exits at 1,800 feet uh, here. here. This, this is a. Um, you know, these, these lakes are not there now, now but you, but you look, look at satellite images. images it appears, appears that it's kind of an inch where there was a lake at one time. And so the theory now is that there was water stored, which you and I can explain as leftover flood water that at some point went over the edge and started to carve it out and, and went very quickly to where the uh, where the Colorado River is now. Secular geologists, again these aren't creationists, now believe that massive flash floods have occurred in the Grand Canyon resulting from breached lava dams. As much as a third of the canyon's depth may have been cut in the blink of a geologic eye. They found evidence of 400,000 cubic feet per second flow that occurred about 4,000 years ago. That's interesting. They're getting really close now uh, to the Bible dates, the time of the flood. So again, I found that to be very interesting. Now, somebody says, okay, well, we didn't witness any of that. That's true. We didn't witness that. 
And all we can do, I guess like in anything, when you, when you study it and, and examine it, you see uh, things like this, you see old rocks, you see old fossils, you know that something died, you know that something happened, you don't necessarily know when. But something that happened uh, more recently in our day is Mount St. Helens, which, again, I was about 12, I guess, about to turn 13 when this happened in 1980. And not that I was glued to the news, but you couldn't miss the news for a while. All the coverage of Mount St. Helens erupting, all this sort of thing. But the interesting thing is, there's a lot of features in Mount St. Helens, canyons that were formed. Some people call it a miniature Grand Canyon. Now, it's a much smaller scale as the Grand Canyon is. It's like 1 40th of the scale of what the Grand Canyon is. But the features are very, very similar to some things that you see in the Grand Canyon. So here's a couple of pictures of the explosion when the uh, volcano went, went off uh, there and the uh, amount of, and I'm told, I'm not an expert on this by any stretch of imagination, I'm told that this is one of the weaker volcanoes in history. When they study other volcanic eruptions, this isn't even like one of the biggest ones. But the things that it did is really amazing. We, we wasn't busy about saying, oh, I don't know how, how long after it happened, four or five years from, but there's still timber laying on all those mountains and hills around it. And we, of course, we weren't on Mount St. Helens, we were on a mountain near it, okay, and you were looking at Mount St. Helens, and you built a, a ter observatory there. Okay. Very but they talked about, I don't know where the water came from, but there, there was a huge lake that went down through one of those camps, not a lake, but a river, I don't know where the water came from. But there were logs, there's one guy in the county, he rode logs down that river after an explosion and survived. Huh. But uh, just the power of that thing, it just, it's just hard to imagine. You see all that timber laying for miles and miles yes, sir. and miles. They probably collected t timber for 10 years after that thing. Right, was. right. That's a great point, you know, and I mean, as you were saying that, it reminded me of, you know, thinking about at the time of the flood, if you'd had stuff like that going on worldwide, I no, yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Great point. So if I get some of this wrong on Mount St. Helens, you you correct me on some of this right here. So again, you got pictures like that that were taken uh, from a distance. Uh, so they had uh, had a mushroom cloud forty miles wide and fifteen miles high. Uh, this was a photograph taken taken thirty five miles west in Toledo, Washington, uh, at the time of the eruption that occurred there. Uh, here's an, again a, an amazing picture there of all the, the ash and the lava and all that there's spewing smoke that is coming out of that thing. Um, this is taken from 22,000 miles above at the time. But you can see the, again, the effect that this thing had, not just here, but you see the smoke and the ash and all that that was carried uh, various places. And again, you can imagine at the time of the flood, if you had that going on on a worldwide scale, uh, what that had been like at that time. Here's a before and after picture I thought was, was very interesting. So here's before the explosion, here's after the explosion. I mean, like it. There was a guy on the mountain this side of it. You know, they predicted it's like a long time that, that it was going to blow. I mean, they had those news and everything else. There was a, a guy reported, he was there with the camera and everything, he was going to film the explosion, which he did. But it killed him. I mean, My goodness. He was, he was, the explosion was so great that it hit him. He wow. He was in a safe place, you know. Yeah. But I think they recovered somebody's film, I believe. Huh. Wow. My goodness. Here's a <clears throat> close-up of the crater. And you see how it devastated uh, the, the uh, mass there. But what you see there, and again, we know this from Mount St. Helens because this was witnessed. Now, if somebody, if nobody had ever recorded this, what happened in Mount St. Helens, and came back 500 years later and looked, they say, Oh, this happened over millions and millions of years. It's the same types of things you see in the Grand Canyon. But we know here that was not the case. This is a very brief time that this happened. Here's a guy, again, you see the layers here in this particular canyon. It says southwest of Spirit Lake, North Fork, Toodle River. Does that sound familiar? Here's the guy standing there to give you an idea of the scale, how big this is. All of this was deposited within uh, at most a couple of years. And again, you see all these layers. If you didn't know better, you would say, oh, that happened over a long, long period of time. It did not. It did not. So this is, um, this first layer right here, is, they say, is from May 18th, 1980. Uh, airfall, the ash and stuff like that, that settled, 
in this area. And then here you have pyroclastic flow. I guess that's the lava itself that began flowing and covering. Begin notice how it formed layers here. And then here was a mud flow, March 18th, 1982. This didn't take millions of years. This took less than two years to form what you see there, all those layers that you're looking at. Not millions of years. And again, that goes along with what you see at the Grand Canyon and other places. You see those nice, neat layers. There's not time for erosion and various things that take place. It's just right there, layer on layer. And then later on, you have water that came and watched this way that you could expose this and see these layers. This is the mud flow here they're talking about from March 19th, 1982. So this is a couple years after the big explosion, which still had some activity going on there in the mountain. Here's another place there in the uh, area here. And again, you see these nice layers right here that are formed. Again, these layers were deposited very quickly. Uh, another area, Little Grand Canyon is what this is called. And I've heard people talking about this. I've heard a couple of lectures on this. Uh, said it looks just like the Grand Canyon. A lot of its features that you see as you look at this thing. This is, uh, says evidence from Mount St. Helens and other areas has challenged the old belief that massive rock layers and river valleys take millions of years to form. This is the little Grand Canyon, Mount St. Helens. It did not take millions of years. This happened very, very quickly. And the, again, with a matter of, of weeks, years, uh, a couple years. Uh, this is Engineers Canyon uh, in Mount St. Helens. This is uh, Spirit Lake. I don't know, I, 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 don't, I assume it's not like this anymore, I don't know. But this was uh, post-eruption. And the amount of uh, wood that you had from the trees and stuff. And we, it kind of gives you an idea. We're talking uh, the other day about the log rafts that, I mean, people, you're talking about people surviving, floating in logs. You could have had some of the same thing at the time of the flood, after the flood, that these log mats that uh, animals could have been transported to other continents and plants could have been uh, transported on some of those as well. This is um, related to this. Uh, Yellow, uh, Yellowstone National Park is further to the east, uh, quite a bit of ways. But this, they have a petrified forest. And I'm told, have you been to Yellowstone? Yeah. Four times. I, I never saw the petrified forest. Okay. Okay. Somebody, uh, one, one of these speakers, speakers I heard said there was one of these where they had a sign saying these were formed over millions and millions of years. But they said after Mount St. Helens actually took that part out of the sign, well, indicating that they are now thinking, well, this may have happened a lot quicker than what we think. Utah, where it is, but they were all laying on the ground. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Charlie. Well, in the Amos 8 11 said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a fountain in the land, not a fountain of the bread, nor a thirst for water. But uh, hearing the word of the Lord. All right. God's, God's, I, I, I agree, agree, Charlie. God's, God's word is, where is that? That's, that's right. It says, across the valley rises the slopes of Specimen Ridge, but the forest you see there today is only the latest chapter in a remarkable story. Buried within the volcanic rocks that compose the mountain are 27 distinct layers of fossil forest that flourished supposedly 50 million years ago. And you see a sign that has some of that. I don't know if this particular one, but like I said, I heard a speaker say that at least in one place in Yellowstone, they take it out the millions of years, and I think, well, it could have happened much quicker than what we think. But back to the logs there in Spirit Lake. So eventually, this is what happened. Like the, the, uh, the stump, the root part would get waterlogged and become heavier than the rest of it, and eventually it would turn upright in the lake. And we see that in parts of these lakes where they will settle, and they settle in different layers. Again, this didn't happen over millions of years. And that's what people say about us. Again, we know that this wasn't millions of years. That's what they say in other places. But this happened very, I say very quickly. Over the years after that eruption, in the last 20 years, you'll see something like this. So you had upright floating logs that eventually float at the bottom, covered with sediment and this sort of thing. And this is what you see. Again, not buried over millions of years. And 
as far as, and we're going to look at uh, some examples of, uh, these are what they call polystrate fossils. These are trees that go through many ages of rock, so to speak. Again, you and I, common sense would tell us this, if a tree were standing there and if a tree died, it's not going to sit there over millions of years, it's going to rot and it's going to break off, it's not going to, it's not going to be st uh, still standing to allow that to happen. The only thing that makes sense is that it happened very, very quickly. So, so polystrate fossils are great evidence to destroy this myth of billions of years. It didn't happen that way. But that's what you see at the bottom of this lake. And here's a, an example of a polystrate fossil. This is in uh, Cookville, Tennessee, uh, as a matter of fact. So here's a tree growing through layers of rock. So petrified trees are found that frequently pass through several layers of rock proving the deposits happen at the same time instead of over millions of years. Somebody says, where's your evidence to disprove millions of years? Those are one of the best ones I know. Hey, there's no way that happened over millions of years. I just thought about this, but their theory of the tree would get buried by different layers over millions of years kind of goes against their overall going to get the water theory. Because if the tree's going to get buried by sediment, then the land should be rising equal to what the water may be rising. Yeah. So we should equal out somewhere. Yeah. I don't see how you're going to bury a tree with sediment. There's not enough sediment to move around unless everything is just becoming higher and higher. Yeah. yeah. Which means all our houses should eventually just be under dirt. That's, That's true. true. That's true. That's, That's a good point. point. That's a good point. Uh, here's some on polystrate fossils. Trees have been found in rock layers standing up. We just showed you a couple pictures of that. Trees have been found upside down in some cases in layers of rock. And again, that's hard. We would expect that to be a type of a flood thing. That sometimes that maybe they turn the wrong way. They didn't go upside down. Uh, trees in the lake near Mount St. Helens have done this, as we said. Evolutionist Derek. Uh, Ager, or however you uh, say that, expressed, if one estimates the total thickness of the British coal measures is about a thousand meters, laid down in about 10 million years, then assuming a constant rate of sedimentation, it would have taken 100,000 years to bury a tree 10 meters high, which is ridiculous. So here's the evolutionist that admits that's ridiculous to say it took millions of years to do that. Alternatively, if a 10 meter tree were buried in 10 years, that would mean 1,000 kilometers in a million years or 10,000 kilometers in 10 million years. This is equally ridiculous, and we cannot escape the conclusion that sedimentation was at times very rapid indeed, and at other times there were long breaks in sedimentation, though it looks both uniform and continuous. So he's still trying to stick his millions of years in here, too, but he admits that this could have happened very quickly. And that's, that's what we would, would expect. expect. So here's, here's another one I found online, a tree going through, again, ages of rocks. Again, it wasn't ages of rocks. It happened very, very quickly. All right, back to Mount St. Helens. A couple of uh, things, and we'll leave this in just a minute. A man named Harry Truman, this is an interesting story to me. That was not the president, by the way, but somebody that had the same name as the president. A man named Harry Truman lived in a lodge on the mountain. He was born three days before the eruption to leave. So they said it's about to blow, as Brother Lloyd said, they knew something was about to happen, so you need to leave. Uh, he said he had lived there for 50 years and nothing had happened. It, uh, the mountain, had not been active for 123 years since 1857. In March of 1980, the mountain began to be active. Water in the magma was around 1,700 degrees, but remained liquid. As y'all know, water boils at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 uh, Celsius. But because of the pressure, it was still liquid, making it um, very, what would you say, uh, very explosive type, there a lot of pressure. Once it's exposed to just a normal air pressure, it's going to vaporize. Yes. And it's going to explode. Yes. A lot of, lot of pent-up power. But main liquid under high pressure, the explosion released the equivalence of 20 million tons of TNT when it blew. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it's considered to be one of the weaker volcanoes in recorded history. I mean, it's very powerful, but it's not one of the stronger ones. However, it's one of the most studied and recorded volcanic explosions ever. In the first phase, half a cubic mile of rock was released, moving 150 miles per hour. Again, that was recorded. Can you imagine rock moving, that amount of rock moving that fast, the destructive power that it would have? Again, can you imagine that during the flood, multiplied all over the planet, being like that. Huge rocks were blown five miles away in the air. That's hard to imagine, too, isn't it? We've got that guy up there on that other mountain. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The succeeding blast 
moved at 650 miles per hour and overtook the initial rock release. So had a first release that was going 150 miles per hour, then a second one that overtook the first one. Plants and animals were fossilized immediately. So it takes millions of years to make a fossil. No, it does not. No, it does not. It happened very quickly. Mud flows reached speeds of 95 miles per hour and slowed to 30 miles per hour as it went into the valley. The mud ran anywhere between 30 and 60 feet deep. Huge steam pits were formed. It cut out canyons in minutes and hours. It happened quickly, but according to present reckonings of time, it would have been dated as thousands and millions of years old. Whereas if somebody had walked up on that and say, years later, not knowing what happened, well, this happened over millions of years. We know that was not the case. Lamination occurred, which formed thousands of paper-thin layers called varves. Uh, these were formed within hours. Gary Rosenquist photographed the explosion 11 miles away. The, cl the blast cloud was deflected over his head. Here's one that survived, different than the one you talked about. The uh, ash cloud went up thousands of feet within 15 or 20, day, uh, 20 days travel around the world. And I was reading something about this guy, talking about how lucky he was that he thought he was safe. And again, had it not deflected, he would have been a goner. One city in Washington had to turn on its street lights within hours of the blast in the middle of the day. In the flood of Noah's day, ash clouds would have lowered temperatures while oceans would initially have been very hot, as we talked about last time. As the ocean waters cooled, you would have had rain and then snow. An ice age would have occurred, which would have lasted decades and maybe even centuries. The 9,677-foot mountain, Mount St. Helens, is now 8,300 feet tall. It's lost that much of its height uh, due to the explosion. Other events happened there until 1991. A mud flow occurred in 1982 that breached 600 feet of sediments from previous explosions. A river had been dammed up by these, this uh, this. Uh, formation. The mud flow allowed the river to flow once again. A canyon system very similar to the Grand Canyon was formed at a scale of 1 to 40. In just 20 years, a cliff face, which was originally made of sand, silt, and ash, had become very solidified. It doesn't take a lot of time for this to happen, as we see in this particular example. 200 square miles of forest were turned into ash. 600,000 homes could have been built from trees destroyed in 10 minutes. There was a three-square-mile uh, three lake near the mountain named Spirit Lake. The mudslide went into this 250-foot-deep, three-mile lake and displaced the water 160 feet, uh, scouring everything in its path down to the bedrocks, sloshing back and forth, again, wearing away soil and everything else. It tore away trees around the lake and deposited approximately a million trees into the lake. And as a side note, that shows how quickly coal can be formed in a catastrophic event such as this. 20,000 vertical upright logs were floating in the lake five years after the explosion. Studies later revealed that within 20 years, a half million logs had been submerged with sedimentation going on. It looks like forest growing it, uh, on top of forest, like Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone. Whereas if somebody were digging that up, you'd see trees at different layers. But again, it happened as it, things sunk at different times or whatever in this brief period of time. Uh, the, let me see, Specimen Ridge was thought to be 50 million years old in Yellowstone. Core sampling was done in Yellowstone. The study showed that the trees were from the same forest. And I think that's when they took that sign down. So they studied the different trees in there and said, these are the trees from the same, same time. Cor um, again, a sign was taken down that said they formed over millions of years. We now know those trees in Yellowstone came by volcanic action in one event just as happened at Mount St. Helens. And so you see uh, other things like that, other canyons around the world. This is one I did not see, Bryce Canyon. I wish I had, we saw that on the map and we didn't go, but uh, we were told it's really beautiful. But here's a picture of that uh, thing. Again, you see layers, and, but again, this parts have been washed away by water. Uh, here's an example of water erosion that you see uh, here. You see all kinds of things like this out west. And there's not a drop of water now. Then how do you explain that? Well, we can explain it with flood and flood water that broke through in various places and washed things like this out very quickly. That's a, that's a neat formation there. Beautiful, that is beautiful. That is beautiful. Uh, there's a canyon in China. Uh, that was Again, you see stuff like this around the, uh, around the world. Uh, here's another one in China. House is built on that. I thought that was cool. There's a canyon in Mexico that says it's larger than is that right? Yeah. I've seen documentaries on TV about it. Okay. I don't remember the name of it. They say it's larger than the Grand Canyon. Okay. 
Very neat, very neat. Another thing related, as they study the, so the types of soils at the Grand Canyon and other places, it matches soil from here. How did soil from the eastern United States wind up here at the Grand Canyon? Again, it's hard for them to explain. It's easy for us to explain with a worldwide flood, very easily could have been deposited there. The distinctive sand grains found in Concanino sandstone of Grand Canyon are pure quartz and were most likely transported from a source as far as northern Utah or Wyoming. In southern Utah, the Navajo sandstone is made of distinctive sand grains that are most likely transported from the Appalachians of Pennsylvania and New York. And these aren't creationists saying this. This is secular scientists saying this. This matches stuff over here. Things here that, that came down here, things that came down here. How do they explain it? I don't know. We can explain it. Again, the flood is what caused that. Again, that's a very interesting thing. That didn't happen with wind erosion. You had a lot of water very quickly that washed something like that away. Uh, it's like a John Wayne movie right there. See layers right here, but again, washed away very quickly. That's an interesting formation. I blew a hole in that rock. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's another one. Sedimentary rock. Uh, again, sedimentary rock is rock that is laid down by water. And got a, another one that I uh, slide I don't have ready for you, for you yet, but what they call uh, turbidity. I'm not an, an expert on this. Like I said, I was reading about this yesterday. But uh, water that was formed not just by water but underwater. Is what, what that is. And they said as much as 50% of sedimentary rock they now believe wasn't formed just by water, but it was formed underwater, which again matches exactly with the flood model. Wind erosion? I don't think so. Uh, how, how do uh, scientists explain this? Uh, bent rocks. I'm not an expert on rocks, but I don't think rocks bend very well. You try to bend, it's going to break. The only explanation for that is that's very soft ground that hardened later on. You see things like that all over uh, the place here. Folded rocks. Again, you can't fold rocks very well without them breaking. Uh, that's a hard one to explain. Circular rocks. It's almost like God is showing off sometimes in some of these things that, that he did. Uh, fish eating a fish that got fossilized very quickly. I don't I think, think that fish, fish died of indigestion. indigestion. I, think I think it got buried at the time of Noah's flood. flood. Uh, a, couple a couple of things, things about Mount St. Helens uh, and coal formation. formation. The, the explosion of Mount St. Helens blew out enough material to fill a 10 cubic yard dump truck every second of every day for 600 years. That kind of puts in perspective how quickly things can happen and how quickly it happened here on, in this case. Uh, three feet of bark formed at the, on the bottom as the trees bumped into each other, kind of rubbed the bark off, and it will form coal in relatively quickly under the right conditions. Plants become, become coal and animals, animals become oil. Uh, around, around the world in various places, 60 feet tall trees have been found under 14,000 feet of mud. Yeah, yeah, for us, that's not hard to explain, but there are, again, some, some of the flood uh, things, things that were left. One, one person, person, I saw a speaker was talking about this, a guy named Kent Hobart was telling this story. One, one person working for an oil company said they drilled down through a thousand feet of permafrost in Barrow, Alaska. And that's, that's uh, again, soil, soil that stays frozen or par partially frozen year-round. And it hit a 300-foot tall tree standing up. Uh, in Montana, there's a coal mine 10,000 square miles, 200 feet th uh, thick. Dinosaur prints have been found in coal layers, sometimes in the ceiling. It's hard to explain. Uh, petrified, petrified trees standing up and have been found in coal layers. Human artifacts, artifacts have been found inside coal. Things like iron pots, bells, vessels, uh, gold chains, carved stones, the sole of a shoe has been found in coal. And so what's the significance of that? Well, they said coal was formed long before humans came on the, on, on the scene. That shows that's not the case. That's not true. Uh, cold, cold water, water absorbs CO2, CO2 carbon dioxide, dioxide that leaves less in the atmosphere and does not filter out as much sun radiation. Uh, CO2 in the water would also shorten lifespans. That could be one reason why you see the ages starting to de decrease a little bit at the time of the flood. I don't know. Uh, let's see. This is in Western Australia, uh, for instance. Uh, coal seam has been found that are hundreds of feet thick. Most coal is composed primarily of bark. Again, I'm not an expert in this area of Australia. It doesn't look like I see a bunch of trees growing here. 
Again, again, how did that happen? happen? The flood, flood is the best explanation of something, something like that. that. Uh, again, the idea of human artifacts and coal and other layers. Why, why is that the case? case? Why, why do you find human artifacts and layers of coal? That shouldn't be the case. Here's a, a, few, a few specific examples. In Illinois, a woman found a 10-inch gold chain and lump of coal. Well, how did that happen? It didn't take millions of years for the coal to form. In 1912, an iron pot was found in coal in Thomas, Oklahoma. A four-and-a-half-inch high zinc and silver vessel was found in 1851 in Dorchester, Massachusetts, in a solid rock that was supposed to be 600 million years old. What was that indicate? That's misrated by science. Uh, a clay doll was found at a depth of 320 feet near Napa, Idaho in 1889, and a rock layer supposedly 12 million years old. A copper arrowhead and human bones were found in a vein of silver in Yeoman, Colorado in 1865. Advanced stone tools were found in California gold mines in 1880. Uh, they were misspelled that, were, were found underneath thick, undisturbed layers of lava, range from 9 to 55 million years old. Now, the idea of undisturbed is important. That means somebody didn't dig down in and place it there, which happened at the time that these things were being formed. Advanced stone tools were found in the 1950s by Thomas E. Lee of the National Museum of Canada. The deposits were found in layers dated to 65,000 to 125,000 years of age. The museum director was fired for refusing to fire the discoverer. And, and that shows how sometimes they want to suppress this type of evidence. They don't want people to see this type of thing. So the person that brought it was supposed to be fired. The guy didn't fire him, and he got fired. You know, you saw that when we were up in Michigan one time. We spent about three weeks going back and forth to the next. But that was a place, I believe it was a major lake superior. But uh, cor it's coral that had fossilized into rock. So there was a huge sea there before that had, had coral. Just like having around Australia and all that. Wow. In fact, my wife made me buy one for $20. <laughs> <laughs> I still had it somewhere. But you can look at the fossilized rock and it looked like a piece of coral. How about that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very, Very neat. neat. I mean, that's interesting how that, what that's doing with that early history. Yes. 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 Great, Great point. point. Great Charlie. point. Charlie. Well, in Isaiah 61, three. It talks about for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called the trees of righteousness and the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Tree of righteousness, righteousness. I, I like that. that. They, they need to be rooted, rooted uh, like it talks about in Psalms 1, the tree growing by the, uh, by the water. Good, Good point. I'm sorry. Very good, very good. Uh, some say that all the plants on earth today could not make the amount of coal in the ground today. Uh, the planet may have been covered from pole to pole with lush vegetation, and, and I, I think there's a lot of proof of that, too. Uh, areas in Antarctica and other places that you have forests, and there's nothing there uh, growing now. Okay, a couple other points related to uh, age and dating. We talked about the uh, written language and written history that the oldest you get there is less than 5,000 years old, 4,500, 4,000 as far as written language and written history. There are other things like that relating to coral and other things that again point to the biblical timeline. The oldest deserts uh, on the earth are less than 4,400 years of age. Why is that the case? Well, again, you would expect that in our model, with the flood occurring about 4,400 years ago, you wouldn't expect, you wouldn't expect any deserts to be older than that. They're showing today. The Sahara Desert has a prevailing wind pattern, which causes desertification. It's getting a little bit bigger all the time. It is about 4,000 years old. So why is the biggest desert in the world less than 4,400 years old? And for us, it's the flood. We know the answer to that. The flood that occurred approximately 4,400 years ago. The oldest living tree. Why is the oldest living tree less than 4,400 years of age? Now, again, as I said, there are some people that say, they've actually done some studies and say it is possible for some trees, not most trees won't, but some trees could survive being under months of water. So there may be some trees that did survive the flood in some locations. Uh, a 1977 science book that's, again, wasn't a friend of Christianity, stated that a 4,300-year-old bristlecone pine in California is the oldest uh, Earth's oldest organism. 
That's less than the date of the flood, which is what we would expect to be the case. As I mentioned, some studies show that trees could survive longer than that, but that's the uh, oldest one. Um, I put here as a side note, a professional, uh, that should be wood carver, grew trees. They cut them after seven years, and they always have at least 11 rings according to that uh, wood carver. Somebody says, what's the point of that? Well, they try to date the trees by the tree rings, just like the ice rings. They try to date ice by the ice rings. That is not always an annual thing. And again, I'm not a professional wood carver. Here's a professional wood carver that says seven-year-old trees always have at least 11 rings. So it's not necessarily an annual thing. It can be based on the amount of rainfall or whether you could have, uh, it could grow faster during parts of the year and slower or whatever. Tree ring dating is not an exact science. Uh, trees often produce more than one ring each year because of periods of drought and periods of excessive rainfall, as well as temperature. For example, a tree with 2,000 tree rings would have a max age of 2,000 years, but actually could be younger than that is the point of that. Okay. All right. Thank you again for your good attention and for humoring me and uh, listening to this material. This is good information. Uh, I appreciate that. It is to me too.